Hebrews chapter 7. We will start here in verse 11 and go through. And they, do I want to go through 20? Yeah, we'll go through 19. Hebrews 7, 11 through 19. Now, perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clear still. If another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. I don't remember this section exactly where I left, so sorry uh, for that, but we'll stop, we'll stop there right now. Um, what do you guys, what, from chapter 7 so far, tell me what you... What's jumped out at you, what you hit, what, what you remember. Just some main things from chapter 7. Jerry, give me one. Excellent point. So it, from verse 11, uh, Mr. Hoffman said it's imp um, the old, the Levitical priesthood in verse 11, and then a little bit later it says, going to say the law made nothing perfect. So those two things together weren't going to bring perfection. And the point is implied that God wants perfection. And so that this new covenant is going to be the means by which God actually brings that about. So you know, it's, it's a, actually a very key point because so many people, that they, their brain doesn't even go there. You talk, you talk to anybody who thinks of themselves as Christians. You sit down, you start talking to them, start Bible studying with them. One of the first words you're going to hear out of their mouth is that, you know, we know we'll we'll, we're always going to sin. We're always going to, just nobody goes, nobody thinks about it. It's not even on the table that God's intention would be actually to bring us to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, individually, let alone congregationally, okay, or his church uh, collectively. So it's a very key point. This is, where God, this is God's plan. This is where he's going, and he has a means by which he's going to do it. Excellent. What else? Davis. Definitely. So from verse 12, another key point, the priesthood determines the law, not the other way around. It, it is interesting how oftentimes I will read something the way I, the way, what you expect it to say. One of the reasons I never wanted to proofread my own papers, right? Hey, write up your paper and then, hey, mom, would you give this a quick readover? Because Otherwise, I can read it for what I thought it, what I knew I wanted it to say instead of for what it said. And so lots of times people do that. I mean, you have the whole denominational world reads Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And the way they read it in their mind is he who believes and is saved should be baptized. It's what they expect it to say. They don't slow it down. So here's one. It's very easy to say in your brain, when, when the law is changed, of, the, of necessity, that there takes place a change of priesthood. But that's not what it says. It says it the other way around. When the priesthood is changed, of necessity, that there takes place a change of law also. So, um, Davis, I don't remember exactly how you said that, but the priesthood 
is the basis upon which the law is given, not the other way around. There clearly, you know, I, I talked about uh, some spiritual irreducible complexity, some mutual dependence upon each other, because then from the law going forward now, there's rules about the priesthood. But very key point, the, uh, the priesthood inaugurated or brought in the, the covenant. Mel. I'm having a little trouble with this changing of the law with the priesthood uh, situation. The priesthood changed as far as the person changed quite often. The law didn't get changed quite often. It still remained. So where, where, where was the change of law because of the change of the priesthood? Okay, good, very, very good question, Mel. So when, when this is talking about the change of priesthood, it's not taking, talking about the change of priests. Now, I actually hadn't thought about this, what you're saying, but he, he's going to reference that a little bit later here in chapter 7. Those priests of that first priesthood they were prevented by death from continuing. So there was always a transfer. A guy dies, it transfers to the next priest, the next line in Aaron. But the priesthood itself isn't changed because in that law was given this priesthood. So Moses, if, you, if we remember, Moses sprinkles both the book itself and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood and says, this is the blood of the covenant, right? So that's where the covenant came in from the priesthood. From that point forward, the high priest is the oldest living descendant of Aaron. So even though it's kind of like our Supreme Court justice system in a way, it's just there's one of them. When this guy dies, the next guy comes in and takes his place. The next, so the priesthood itself isn't changed even though the priests are changed. Here there's a huge shift. Instead of from the priesthood of Aaron, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So that order, the whole priesthood system, if you will, changed. And that's, so that's what he's driving at when he says when the priesthood is changed, he's talking about when that order of priesthood, when the system is changed. There, the only way that can work is if the law changes too. We can, think, we can think about it in a negative way. If our judicial system in the United States were to change, there would, we would have to throw out the Constitution. Okay. And people want to. Exactly. That's a negative thing. Now, of course, we know this was God's eternal plan. But here... Because on the basis of the priesthood, the people receive the law. If the priesthood is changed now, there's going to have to be a change of law. I'll let you say that in here. In a similar fashion, we had a revolution at the end of the revolution the laws were completely changed, and then the constitutional bodies were set up around, around that. True. So the, the change took place first, then the supporting staff for the new constitution was put in place. Yeah, that's a good point. And even with the Articles of Confederation, it's kind of illegal what they did <laughs> to bring in the constitution. Here, the difference is God won't ever break his law. So this change was planned. But that's a good illustration in the physical realm. Mr. Sun. I'm really, Give me a second here. Hey. I'm really okay with you waiting on this if you think there's another time for it. But, you know, of course, the priesthood established the law, then the law upheld, continually upheld the priesthood. Yep. So, actually, since we have a new priesthood now, the new law, if you will, which is the law of Christ, is going to uphold the priesthood. And so the question, of course, is um, we, we know for sure that, Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. What in the world is our priesthood? Uh, now, 
I know what I have my answer that makes 100% sense to me. Um, and I have, I have had people throw shade, Mormon shade at me for thinking this. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know, is, is it a time to answer that? Because we keep talking about that. Is it a time to talk about, you know, the new law of Christ? What priesthood, we know the high priesthood, but what priesthood is upheld? Or should we wait for sure, later for sure. that? Sure, I think that's, yeah. It's, um, so the, the main thrust of Hebrews 7 obviously has to do with Jesus' high priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, right? And when that changes, of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. But like Phil said, okay, under that old system, even though the priesthood brought in the law, now that law upholds, it, it, it tells you how the priesthood is going to go, right? So in the new covenant, we have how many high priests according to the order of Melchizedek? One, okay? And he's going to hammer that at the end of chapter 7. Only one. But, is there a priesthood? How, how do I say this? Under the Old Covenant, how many high priests were there ever at one time? One. Let's throw out the politics that was going on in the time of Jesus. But there's supposed to be one. But, was there a whole priesthood under that? Yes. And I... I don't know if this is what you're alluding to. So you have the Levitical priesthood. The tribe of Levi has a bunch of functions. But within the tribe of Levi, from the certain family, you have the family of priests under the order of Aaron. Only one high priest, though, at a time. And so I think the question is, what about the priesthood of us as Christians? And so this isn't... You know, sometimes I can point to book, chapter, and verse and I absolutely hammer something out. But, but this is where I am, this is what I would say. Melchizedek, what is, he was, what's that name mean again? King of righteousness, right? And then he's king of Salem, which is king of peace. Underneath that high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, does he have any priests? He does. First Peter chapter 2 would hammer that home, right? So who are the, what would we call that priesthood? Well, we're under, our, let's ask this. go to Revelation 1 really quick. Revelation 1 verse, we'll pick up 5 and 6, but particularly keen in on verse 6. Revelation 1 verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us to be a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Anybody have a new King James or King James on them? Does yours say kingdom, or does it say he's made us to be kings? Kings and priests. Okay, so are we as Christians kings? Do, do we reign, has he raised us up with Christ? Seated us with him in the heavenly places? Do we reign with Christ? What kind of kings would we be? I mean, the policeman pulls you over and you say, ah, or it's tax time and you say, oh, Jesus said, consequently, the sons are exempt. I'm a king, so you got no authority or jurisdiction over me. I mean, you can try it, but you will end up in the federal pen. How are we kings? We're kings of righteousness under our King Jesus. Okay? So the long and the short of Phil, where I'm going to end up, same with the priests. Are we priests, that, uh, this king of peace, do we have peace toward God? As such, can we offer up our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice? So if somebody were to ask me, what order are we of? I would say we're priests of the order of Melchizedek, 
but there's only one high priest of Melchizedek. Is that where you would go? And, you know, and obviously, you know, the times that I've even said that, you know, people are, by the way, if you don't know this, people are always trying to put our churches in the same category as Mormons. Mm -hmm. They just are all the time. <laughs> and so this just gives them another reason. But um, can, can, can the high priesthood be of a different order than the rest of the priesthood? It just doesn't even make no sense. Way. You know, and, and we are raised up with Christ, and so we are priests by the power of an Amen. indestructible life. You know, we are. You know, nobody can separate us from the love of God's indestructible life. And so unless we're going to say there's this strange, different priesthood that, that exists that, that's mysterious and nobody can talk about, um, I, I can't, in my mind, sort out anything else but that. Yes, and that's a really good point, too, that I had meant to throw in. We have been raised up with Christ, haven't we? And so through Jesus, through his ultimate indestructible life, he's given that to us as well. It's also, I do find it interesting, and this is simply a, a fun parallel. If you're trying to prove this to somebody, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't suggest it. But for us as Christians, a fun parallel is in the book of Ezekiel. And you get that new temple. Let's actually flip back there really quick. Ezekiel 44, verse 15. Now, we understand this is prophetic, and so, wow, I'm not even hooked in yet. Oh, I just lost my spot. <laughs> okay. Ezekiel 44, 20, uh, or 44, 15 it says, but the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, and the sons of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares the Lord God. We obviously aren't Levitical priests, but I do find it interesting. The sons of Zadok, that's exactly the same ending as Melchizedek. And so we're priests of righteousness through under the order of Jesus Christ. So you know, again, I think that's the only logical conclusion I can come to. But I don't have a book, chapter, and verse that calls us priests according to the order of Melchizedek. But like you said, why would our high priest be of a different order than we are? He sets that order. So appreciate that thought. What else you guys get out of chapter 7? All right, we'll just launch back in then. Wow, my, I told Mr. Hoffman earlier today, my brain's a little foggy. I'm having a hard time finding Hebrews. That's not a good sign. So, <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 7. Um, of course, we talked about Jesus being from the tribe of Judah. So this whole, this this whole system has to change for this to work. All right, let's pick it up in verses 18 and 19. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So there's a setting aside of this former commandment. How many of you had interactions with either Seventh-day Adventists or Messianic Jews or I mean, Messianic Judaism for some reason is really big right now? And of course, the, the implication there is that, you know, basically Jesus, we, we believe in Jesus, but he's God, we still are supposed to keep the law or the main elements. I'll just make it simple. The main elements of the law. And they really 
don't like it if you say that the Old Testament has been done away with. Now, Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 5, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. I'm looking around the room, and I think most of us can understand the New Testament is the fulfillment of that physical picture. The New Testament is the spiritual reality. It's the substance. The physical was a shadow. So it is the fulfillment of. So why would you keep the shadow when you have the real? And Hebrews is actually very definitive in his words. There is a setting aside of. By the time we get to the end of Hebrews chapter 8, which I've always found this interesting, the big Messianic Jews, when they teach, they'll quote this new covenant up to verse 12, 8, 12. They leave out 8, 13 in their main books. Because verse 13 says, when he said a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now, some of you computer guys, Andy, I'm looking at you, I'll pick on you. Obsolete systems. How much use are they in your everyday day? And other, maybe making a virtual reality to play a few old games or something. How much, how much use are they for day-to-day -day practicality of what you do? Wow. I'm glad I asked you that. <laughs> That's a great computer and biblical answer. <laughs> thank you. I think you probably, so thank you for, so they're incompatible. Is it possible to be a messianic Jew? Meaning the way those guys try to use it, a Christ follower who follows the old law. No, it's not. It's incompatible. Read Galatians if you want a quick overview. And what did you say? And dangerous, because it will corrupt the new stuff. Security. So now you're getting a little complicated for me, but I will say this. Satan is the ultimate hacker. If you're trying to keep one foot in that Old Testament <laughs> and one, that leaves you open for Satan. Well, we just know the law doesn't work. And Satan will take you out in that. So, beautiful point that the setting is, there's a setting aside of the old because it's being replaced with the new. Okay? The two, you aren't having the two jointly there together. Was it important for the Hebrew Christians to get that driven through their minds? Destruction of Jerusalem was coming. Their, that whole world, as they knew it, was going to be absolutely obliterated, which God was going to make sure was done so it couldn't compete with the new. But it's also important for us as Christians to make sure we don't do this in our own minds. Okay? The law was weak and useless because the law makes nothing perfect. The law cannot give you a clean conscience. The law can't touch the inner man. Now, you guys have heard me say this before, but thou shalt not go over 75 miles per hour. I don't know why Jillian, I, I locked eyes with Jillian Gothard there for a second. I don't know why, but uh, it cannot touch the inner man. All you care about is not getting caught. Brian Schweitzer, I think you've been caught in our neighborhood before. Not going 75, I hope, but <laughs> substantially faster than 25? Yeah. So you were going 35 in the 25, and this guy's just hanging around there. And they, So the law, the law will catch you, but the law is powerless to change the heart cannot work on the inner man. This new covenant, guys, not trying to jump ahead too much to chapter 8, but it is going to be written, and one of the places it's written is on our hearts. It changes the inner man. What we want. 
The law was powerless to do that. And that's why the law could not bring about perfection. Is the law holy? Yes. Is the law righteous? Yes. Is the law good? Yes. Would there be anything wrong with having the Ten Commandments in every official building in the, in the United States? It, it'd be a great start. It sets a standard for what is good and righteous and holy. But it's, it's weak and useless to change who we are. And so again, Jerry, to your point, the implication is God actually is going to perfection with us. Brother, this is a really fun thing. I don't care where you're at in your Christianity in terms of your growth. If you're brand new and you are still trying to, in Mel's words, immerse the wallet. Okay, he, he was just talking to me the other day about he did a stewardship. Mel, weren't you telling me about you did a stewardship and people go to get immersed into Christ and I think my wallet's on. I'll use yours, Mr. Hoffman. <laughs> Thank you. So they got their wallet and they're going to get dunked. And he said, oh, oh, wait, wait. Don't want to get that wet. Go in, get dunked, then come back out. Everything's new except for the money, okay? Mel, you were telling me you did a stewardship on that, right? And I believe you told me, you asked my dad how long it usually, maybe a, a rough estimate average of how long after a person gets immersed before that wallet falls in there with them. 11 months. How many years ago was that? Long time ago? So now it's probably two or three years, okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying, no matter where it is, if that's still where you are, or if you are pressing on to perfection, and you're thinking, hey, I, you know, the Lord's church needs elders, and I want to be one, and, I'm, and you're getting, this is a beautiful thing. No matter where you're at it, that where God is going with each of us individually, where he will end up with us through the new covenant, and through the priesthood of Jesus Christ, is we will be made perfect. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God has everything in there to help us get there. Now, it's not an instantaneous thing. I noticed in my Bible reading today, the uh, leper cried out to Jesus and said, if you are willing, make me clean. How many of us have said that spiritually? Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. And what's, what's my first thought? <laughs> my first thought was, of course, the Lord's willing. Is, is the Lord willing for any to perish? No. He wants us to come to repentance. Does the Lord take pleasure in the death of the wicked? No, he wants people to repent and live. So of course, of course the Lord is willing. Okay, that's, hey, that's good to know. And spiritually, of course, is where I was going with that. So Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Exactly what we would expect. But then there's this word, you guys can go with me to Matthew 8. Matthew 8, verse 3. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. I am willing to be cleansed. And what's that word? Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Does the blood of Christ cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Is there an immediate cleansing of that? Yes. The spiritual application, immediately, all of those habits aren't instantaneously changed. Okay? Really, the only habit that this guy, per se, had as a leper was going around saying, unclean, unclean. Okay? He probably thrilled to not have to do that anymore. 
And so we're thrilled. We don't, we don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. But there is a, generally a progression here okay, that's going to take for us to be perfected. And the new covenant and the priesthood of Jesus Christ has everything within there for that to happen for us and with us. The, so I guess the reason I'm, I'm saying this is sometimes people hear you shall be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And you're looking at your present performance and you just shut down. And that's what, I think that's why a lot of people want to fight against what that scripture says so hard. Don't shut down. There's a, there's a work here. There's a progression. And God is willing to move us there patiently. One of the things we've seen under the new covenant. So it's, if you can open your eyes to that, not be discouraged about where you are, be real and honest before God about where you are, also with this great hope and expectation that God is going to do in you that which he promises. Along the way, hey, it's really fun, guys. If, if it was, if, have you ever thought about this? If you came up out of the water and instantaneously were perfect, okay, maybe some sort of Wesleyan holiness, you got a second work of grace, you prayed through, and all of a sudden now you can never sin again, and it was an in, in an instantaneous moment. I mean, that sounds really great, except for one thing. You never get to know God. It's through the process of this. Okay, God, how, how does this work? Oh, you want me to see you as you are. Oh, okay. You are a merciful God. You are a patient God. You are a loving God. You are a forgiving God. You are a God who gives grace. You are a God who empowers. You are all of these wonderful things about God that we get to learn. And it becomes a part of who we are and the way that we are with other people. We don't want to skip that. It's fun. It's an amazing thing. So, Main thing I want to drive at here is, yeah, the law was weak and useless. What, what Jerry was alluding to, that old covenant was never going to bring about perfection. The implication here is that the new does. And this, guys, is a very beautiful, positive thing. And if you're shutting down, it's just because you think there's a couple possibilities. But I'm going to say for any of us here, if you're shutting down, it's because you're thinking about the wrong way. And I want to challenge you to step back. And say, okay, what is this new covenant about? What is the priesthood of Jesus about? So we can look at it the right way. <clears throat> Law did make nothing perfect. Now, did God change his mind? Because he said there was a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. Any of you guys remember Mark Miller's message from family camp this year? I know there's a lot of messages. This one, but... The thrust of it was the new covenant wasn't new. It's, it's always been. And that's true. Okay? We saw that, Genesis 14, 15. But the scripture calls it new. And the scripture says this is form. The reason is in simple terms, guys, is Let's just say the covenant that God gave back in the days of Genesis with Abraham and his seed could not be realized in, in human, with, with us as humans until the coming of Christ, until the fullness of time. So God set that in there. That was his plan all along. But the law was added because of transgressions. The law had to become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Without that, I'll just say the human race as a whole, we could never have got there. I love what my dad says about the thickness of the Old Testament. All those pages and those thousands of years, he says, is a, is a representation of the thickness of the human skull. That's what it took for God to get us here. So, that's where he was going. God didn't change his mind. It, it was former, 
Because God understands the way that we're wired, first the natural, then the spiritual. We had to be able to understand that and see that that way. Plan was before the, from before the foundation. I think we need to see these scriptures. We all know this. God's plan was from before the foundation of the world. Right? He knew where he was going all along. Davis. Based upon um, what you said in regards to the message here in Hebrews 7, it says that who has become such not on the basis of the law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. So that priesthood couldn't be put in motion until the priest appeared into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, the true tabernacle, with the power of the indestructible life. And we know that in Romans it says he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Correct. So that actually couldn't be in motion until Jesus came and was the lamb that was slain and actually entered into the Holy of Holies. I agree with you. I will, um, I, will, I will just tack on for the view of man, for the benefit of man. Jesus always had power of indestructible life. We just didn't know it, right? This is his public proclamation to the world that Jesus has this, and we got to see it. And anybody that's honest can still see it. You can check out the facts. Is, did the resurrection happen? And so, yes, you are right. For us to see Jesus as high, for any of this to make sense, he had to do that, right, for us. Same way that Jesus had to come in the flesh so that we know God understands. God understood. We just didn't, we couldn't wrap our mind around that he understood unless he came in the flesh. So I think it's the same, but I agree with you. Yes, power of an indestructible life, that had to happen. That had to be demonstrated before this priesthood could come to its fruition. Yeah, I think about this a lot. Obviously, you know, when it says he was glorified to become high priest, he says, uh -huh. it's referring to his glorified state in which he is in the glorified state. He's a priest forever, and that's backwards and forwards. It's eternity. Amen. One thing that I often think about was, since he was glorified to be high priest there, and he became high priest, you know, in the same way he became Christ, in the sense that you know he was exalted back to that position as the anointed one. Um, um, he, you know, the one you crucified became both Lord. He has made Lord and Christ. You know, we look at all these. This verbiage mm -hmm. is very similar to going from the flesh to the spirit. Um, you know. Was he a priest according to the order of Melchizedek in the short years he was on earth? Now, that's the part that, you know, I'm, I'm going, you know, around in my mind a little bit um, because he was glorified to be that priest. But when he wasn't in glory, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to speculate here, but those are the things that go through my mind. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, when you start thinking about this, it's a very complex matter. Uh, give me just a second, Mel. So I actually remember Cliff and Matt Hartford years ago having a conversation at one of our early, or one of the family camps. I don't remember, Cliff, you're behind the camera. Was it at Luckick or was it at, um, oh, downstairs here? Okay. There were a couple. So anyways, the conversation about was Jesus priest for always in the past or was he, you know, and and it was fun, converse, con, fun discussion, and they they both did it in the spirit of, of Christ. There's a sense in which we say, yeah, he always was, right? He was always Christ. He was always the son. He was always, but he had to demonstrate it for us. Now, here's the interesting, what you said, while he was on earth, the interesting thing is, Hebrews 8 tells us, he could not be priest on earth. And there's one reason why, and I know you don't, I know you understand that, but there's one reason why, because he was under the terms of the old covenant. And that he wasn't from the right tribe, could not be a priest on earth. And that's, did he, did he know who he was? Oh yeah. Did God know who he was? Yeah. Did, can we look back at that and say, well, actually in the days of his flesh, we're a part of his high priesthood for our benefit. Yes. So I think that's, it's, it's difficult to wrap your mind around that whole, 
In one sense, he always was. And even while he was here, the time in his flesh, even though he was not the glorified high priest, he hadn't taken his position as such as viewed toward men. The, one of the reasons he came in the flesh is so that he could do the work of high priest for us to, to realize he could do that work. So I don't think I clarified anything. I think it's, you know, it's where the mind goes. How does that work? It gets pretty complicated as to when. One thing the book of Hebrews is going to drive home. There is a point at which God showed him to be, and that is at his glorification. And I think, Davis, that's really what you were driving at as well. So power of an indestructible life. Good thoughts, guys. Good questions. Have fun keeping chewing on, thinking about. All right. God's plan always been there. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mel. Do you remember what your thought was? Okay, nice. Uh, while Jesus walked on earth, uh, what, what, what do you think was he mentioned about the Holy of Holies? He couldn't even get close to the Holy of Holies. True. Uh, and it also kind of makes me look, look, he said, he cleansed the temple. He didn't cleanse the temple itself. Uh, the, uh, he would have uh, been the territory around the temple grounds that he would have cleansed, been cleansed at the temple where there, where there was other, let's say, let's say offices and, and things. But within the area that the priest operated in, he couldn't get close to that's, it. That's a really great point, Mel. So while Jesus was on earth, he, he couldn't go into the physical holy of holies. He couldn't go into the physical holy place. Go into the courtyard. Priest, and that's when, when he cleansed that. And that's, that's the thing that those guys got so hot about, right? Even when they asked him, what, what authority do you have for this? He says, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it. He knew that wasn't the real one. That one wasn't the real one, but he was going to cleanse the real one, and that didn't happen until the events associated with his death, resurrection, and ascension. So but that's a good point. Yeah, he couldn't go there on earth. The reality of it is I don't think, I don't think Jesus wanted to. You see some of those Old Testament guys, even I think David, you know, they, they want in, they want closer, they want closer. Jesus already... There was, he wasn't going to be any closer in that back room than he was. But, yeah, you are. It's, it's a great point. All right, guys, back to Hebrews chapter 7. Where are we at here? Somewhere on verse 19. Oh, yeah. The law made nothing perfect. and on the, So on the one hand, there's a setting aside. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So this is an interesting term to me for new covenant. Bring in of a better hope. Typically, I think of hope in the scriptures, and I think of the hope of, what do you guys think of? If, typically, if you think of hope. The hope of the glory, right? The resurrection of the body. And that's true. It is the, the driving hope of the Christian. But it seems like here, and I, I'm having a, personally, honestly, a little bit of a tough time wrapping my mind completely around the way this, this is used. But bringing in of a better hope, it's an interesting term for the new covenant. And it seems to me the thrust of this, you know, what, what hope was there under the Old Testament? Was there hope under the Old Testament? Not the same as we have, but was, just put yourself back there. Let's, let's pick on Job. Did Job have any hope? I know that my Redeemer lives. I forget the rest of that exactly, but someday I am going to stand before him is the gist of it, right? So he had a hope of looking forward to. You read David's Psalms. Did, was there some hope? But he was looking forward to. what? you know what all of those guys were looking forward to? What we have? 
That's what they were looking forward to. What we have. I think about Job sometimes, and you know, I know his, his attitude a little bit got a little demanding in terms of talking to God. But what Job wanted is what we have. He wanted to be able to talk to God. So their hope was looking forward to, in this sense, what we have. There is always hope in the setting aside, but there is a better hope in the taking on. You'll see that theme throughout the Old Testament. You know, Romans chapter 6, um, therefore consider yourself dead to sin. Well, there's a hope in that. Yeah. But alive to Christ and God mm. Jesus, that's a better hope. Mm. The, the setting aside, there's a hope, but there's a better hope in the putting on. And I think that's what I think of when I see this verse. Wow, I didn't even think of that, but that's a really good point. Yeah, the... There is a hope of getting rid of the old. That old, that old Testament system will just grind you down. Don't you feel bad for these Catholics today? Really, seriously. It's just guilt, laboring under guilt. So that, that was a hope in and of itself. It was a good thing, right? That, that, that was being set aside. But the better hope is what is available, what's being put on. I, I hadn't thought of that, Phil. That's a really good point. Um, and that is consistent with the New Testament. We're thankful for what God has taken away. But even more, Romans 6.11 is even more powerful than Romans 6.7, if you will. Their, their hope in the Old Testament was that they were God's people. And not only that, they, they looked for the promise. Not the promise that we have, but they would basically have the land that God told them they would have. But their hope was that they were God's people. And not that God indwells with him like, they, like, he, like we have. But. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's going to tie in the end of Hebrews 11, isn't it? Apart from us, this is the, this is the greatest of the Old Testament faithful. The, and apart from us, they would not, because God had provided something better for us, right? Apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And so they were having hope of being God's people. But it's only us, guys, that God dwells in and really walks among us and he does live within us and we live within him so it's, it's yeah it's great hope and maybe the he ties it in here with one other thought and i think it ties in with that hope both sure and steadfast from chapter six where christ has entered as a, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil Those, those guys in the Old Testament didn't get to do that. The way into the very presence of God has been made, has been opened up to us through which we draw near to God. Okay, what, let's, let's just close thinking about this tonight from a positive thing. What a tremendous privilege we have to be able to draw near to God. They wanted it in the Old Testament. Get me closer. Just a little closer. Please, can I just take a peek behind? All of them entered within the veil. We can draw near to God. So I'll, I'll just, we have this tremendous privilege. And so asking this in all sincerity and positively, I want you to ask yourself, have you been doing that? Been drawn near to God? And I think James puts it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God's opened the door. He said, come in. That's, I don't mean this in the, the way that the world uses the words advantage. But let's, in, in, the, in the proper way, let's take advantage of what God, this opportunity, this privilege that God has given to us. It's an amazing thing. You know, when I, I went to college, MSU, I know they had, my professors had office hours, come in during office hours. I never once used them, not once. Just didn't care enough. I mean, really, I had some other back end, you know, my friend that I knew would have gone. Hey, Jeff, what'd you find out? But I didn't care. I mean, most of the time I didn't really need it, but 
when I did, I just didn't care enough to get up there and go during their open office hour. You know what, God? For us, it's open all the time. And so, God has given under the new covenant the opportunity for us to be like Christ, to be made perfect. Do we care enough to draw near? What a privilege. You know, in Billings, when Evie Love was alive, over and over again during a prayer session, one of the things she would say is, I'm thankful for the privilege of prayer. It's like, that is an amazing thing. Sometimes it's easy to just pray, Jesus' name, amen. I, I mean, sometimes listening to school kids pray is really funny because they say the exact same thing every day, Jesus' name, amen. The magic words at the end because you're supposed to. Why is it in Jesus' name? We have this high priest who has opened up the way for us so that we can be heard by God. What an absolutely beautiful time and place to live. God has placed us here in this time, in this place. He is willing to. For us to draw near with confidence to throne, that throne of grace, if we need to receive mercy, then go get mercy. And always, with our attitudes right, we walk away with grace to help in time of need. Do, do we have a huge mission in front of us? Do people need the gospel so desperately? People we know around us, the world is just... I, I was actually super encouraged. A guy told me this, and I don't think he would have any idea how much this meant to me. He's like, Luke, I, want you, I, I hope you keep doing this. I've been studying with him. He's like, I hope you keep doing this. He says, I said, this kind of stuff changes the world. I was like, thank you. I'm just trying to help change him by God's grace. But for all of us, guys, we got a huge mission. And we need the help of the Lord. And he gives us that opportunity, that grace to help. And you know what people need? They need us to bring the word and share it with them. But they also need to see it in us, in our lives, as Christ is doing his work in us. So I just want to encourage us all to take that opportunity. A better hope. So thanks for that, that reading that sharing it that way the setting aside is great that we're not under law but man there is something way better than that isn't there we are alive to god in christ jesus we have access to that throne of grace that's an awesome hope